particular broadcast. Uh, this has been, to say the least, a very, very odd year. Um, and in a time of COVID, when we've all had to do things virtually and, and on camera, uh, including the fact that with my own students, for instance, at UCLA, I have not seen them in person in a year. We've had to do everything technologically. And there's a lot of things that we've all learned as a result of this. First of all, we had no choice. We had to learn how to do these things. Uh, and as a result, um, because I'm an optimist by nature, and hopefully you'll gather that by the end of this, this time that we all have together, I always try to seek the good in a situation. And that'll make a lot of sense once you finish uh, listening to me uh, do my opening patter here. COVID has forced us to think very imaginatively about how we transmit information. Prior to COVID, which was just over a year ago, there's no way any of us might have thought this is a, uh, not only a convenient, but an effective way to communicate with one another. Sure, it's fun to see somebody on, on camera and you're looking at them and, and responding and whatnot, but to actually think that you could educate and mentor and learn from each other. Pre-COVID, I think we would have all laughed uh, had that been the case. Since COVID, we haven't been laughing so much. It's been pretty much no choice but to figure out how to get this information across to people. And one of the beautiful things about all of this is that we've imagined communicating in ways that we never really thought um, uh, possible prior to this. And we've had to adapt. There's a little business card I got once years ago. Uh, I'll never forget it. I don't remember the guy's name. Uh, he gave it to me up at the Banff Center. I don't know what he did for a living. But there was a, what I'll never forget is in the top right corner of the business card, there was a little Tyrannosaurus Rex. And above the T-Rex was Latin script. And below the T-Rex was the English translation. And it just said, adapt or perish. Boom! That takes us to 2020 slash 21 and the COVID crisis. So this is the best we can do. And we've all adapted and had some very, very interesting ways to, uh, as I say, communicate with one another. And today is one of those days. Now, this is what's going to happen. Normally, even with a Zoom chat, we have the wonderful opportunity to keep things intimate in that I could have people normally unmute, uh, ask some questions if they wanted to, and then really make it interactive. Because I'm going to give you a lot of different information about horns. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But I want this to truly feel as though we are interacting and not that just, uh, you know, you're sitting there listening to me blather on. So please feel free to uh, write notes in the chat room. In fact, I sort of really, really hope you will. Uh, I have a spectacular assistant, Adam Stockholm, who is going to be doing all the tech work behind the scenes, and he'll be able to grab your questions and put them into my corresponding uh, chat room. Uh, I'm looking at a Zoom screen, and you all are looking at, I presume, a YouTube channel. So, but that doesn't matter. Please feel free to ask me as many questions as possible. Because the first thing we're going to do is pretty much try to clear the room out of anybody except trumpet players. If you are not a trumpet player, a lot of what we're talking about today will be of little to no interest. Now, if you are not a trouble player and you want to hang around, I'll try to keep it entertaining and moving forward. But what I wanted to do with the time that we have, I was imagining how can we do this without the proper interaction that would normally take place uh, with Zoom. Uh, since we don't have that luxury, I'm going to start a little bit more traditionally just to give you my personal background. And then here you can see on this piano, you can't really see from that angle, I have no fewer than 18 Yamaha instruments. 18, and guess what? I have more. Those are just the ones that I happen to grab. And I'm gonna go through them today and tell you little bits about the instruments themselves, not just because I wanna talk about uh, the particular horns or serial numbers, any of that. That's geek talk that only trumpet players will really love. And I'm happy to answer those questions as much as possible. But also because every one of these horns has a story. And not just a story that's entertaining or interesting, there's also a musical story behind it. And that's how I kind of want to make this particular hour feel, that we're having a chance for me to tell you my story, but tell it to you in the way that an artist would. All artists, regardless of what it is you're trying to do as an artist, should feel that they are transmitting something to an audience by enveloping them, not imposing ideas or, or, or wishes. I can't stand it when musicians take this attitude when they get on stage, well, I'm going to do my thing, and if the audience doesn't get it, well, you know, they're just going to have to figure it out or they're just not ready to hear what I have to say. That is the lamest excuse ever. All right. If you are a young person, rail against that. We're in one business as artists, and that is the business to give something to audiences, to share it with them. Okay. And that's why I thought it would be fun for me to share not only the horns, but the history behind them, 
some of the technical aspects of the instruments themselves and why I chose them, and in some cases, why I did not choose them for certain projects. And that can then lead us, hopefully, to some more specific questions that you might have. All right, let me get on to um, the basics of my own background. First of all, I am uh, not only a Canadian, I'm a very proud Canadian. I grew up in Western Canada in Edmonton. And uh, I only picked the trumpet because I wanted to be a drummer. And in our band, you had to choose trumpet or clarinet because he knew everybody wanted to be a drummer. I was actually in the KISS Army. Yes, that's true. Peter Chris, Paul Stanley, Ace Freely, Gene Simmons did not forget him. No. And so I loved KISS and I wanted to be Peter Chris on a giant hydraulic claw that would lift me up and I could have these rototoms and a spinning hydraulic chair. That was my dream, children, when I was 12. You had to pick trumpet or clarinet. And then in the first two weeks, because the band director knew that he needed a lot of trumpets and clarinets in the ensemble, uh, there were tests. And out of the 15 or 20 trumpets, I think it was close to 20 trumpets that we had, I want you all to guess virtually, because I can't see you, who was last in that exam. Yes, you are correct, it was me. And I went home to, uh, to quit music and I told my mother that I was done with the trumpet and that I wanted to do drama as an option, as an arts option instead. And she said to me, and she's 84 years young, if she was standing right here, she would tell you this right now. She said, we have no quitters in our family. Auf keinen Fall, mein Lieber Junge, das gibt es nicht. You're not gonna start and stop. Das gibt es nicht bei uns im Hause. You're gonna do one year on the trumpet and then you can decide what you want to do with your living. And that was that. So I didn't have a choice. Uh, I was stuck playing the trumpet and again as I like to say if she was standing right here she would say yeah this is what I told him nothing lazy in our family and so it was a very very important moment because what it allowed me to become was a band geek a total nerd and a dweeb as I like to affectionately call myself and incidentally if you are watching this broadcast then you yourselves are geeks as well just deal with it and get over it now that we have, we can move on from there, okay? So the beauty of it was that I discovered, even at the age of 12, uh, the camaraderie of being in bands. We were all coming up together, we were all playing poorly together, and we all learned from each other, but it was so much fun. That's why we did band, that's why we support band, and why we still support bands now. And I was very lucky uh, because my band director, name is Al, still is, Al Jones, uh, who was the junior high band director in Edmonton at Edith Rogers Junior High for Ed Edmontonians that are there. And it was great because he made band really, really fun for us. And that took me to uh, the first six months that I was playing a trumpet. Uh, another pivotal moment happened. I went to the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra. Tommy Banks was conducting and Doc Severinsen was the special guest. Now, if you don't know who Doc is, go to the Google. There was actually a great documentary on Doc uh, just a couple of days ago, a documentary on Doc. I did not plan that. On PBS, and it was a story of his life, and Doc is now 93 years young. And I'll never forget at the age of 12, sitting down in the audience and watching him come up on stage. And he went straight to the microphone, and he was wearing pink leather pants and a lime green jacket. Can't make this up. And he strode up to the microphone and he walked right up to it and he said, Ladies and gentlemen, I don't wear these pants because I look good in them. I wear them because I like the way they feel. And that was it. I stared up at the stage and I said, That's what I want to do for a living. Not the, the butt slapping part. That wasn't it. But it was the ability for Doc to literally capture the audience's attention. He hadn't even played a single note and the place was so filled with magical energy. That's what I remember as a 12 year old, the power of that moment. And then of course he started playing and well, it was on. Everything he did was so, so incredibly awesome. But it was his ability to connect with people that just showed how much fun he was having and as a result, how much fun we were having. And that moment was burned into my mind at a very, very pivotal age. And so the trumpet kind of picked me uh, that's how I really like to describe that particular moment. So there was nothing uh, particularly special or unique about my upbringing. That was the way that it was. Uh, if we fast forward a few years into my, my junior high career, uh, by 10th grade, I was already serious enough that I was choosing a high school based on the music program. 
and I chose a high school in Edmonton called McNally Composite High School and because they had a great band program and a great band director there named Murray Smith. And that was a very, very, also a key moment in my life. A little known fact about my career at McNally, which I don't really talk about a lot for obvious reasons, as you'll soon find out. When I was at McNally, I was also the high school quarterback. Yes, it's true. And our team went 0 and 9. We didn't win one game. And I received at the end of the season, the award, the trophy for most valuable offensive player. I wanted to give it back. I'm like, how can you give me this trophy? We won nothing, which we didn't. Thankfully, Trumpet definitely took over my life, but that was part of my McNally phase. And those three years in high school were also really, really critical because for some of you that may be in high school at this point or middle school or perhaps early college or beyond that, we all remember this particular moment. If you're there right now, you're starting to imagine, what would I like to study after school? Will it be music? Will it be something else? And music really kind of hooked me. Now, I had also very, 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 and still have very immigrant parents who, for any of you that are immigrants, you'll understand exactly what I'm about to say. And for those of you that may not be, you certainly know immigrants. Uh, and the immigrant credo is you have to work, work, work for what you want. There's no free lunch in life. And there's no handouts, there's no gimmies. And the basic work ethic of being an immigrant or coming from immigrant stock is that if you want something, you have to be adamant about it. A lot of people say, I work really hard. But the problem is we don't always take responsibility for not just the work, but perhaps, and more importantly, the lack of work. Now the lack of work, here's the encouraging part is something you can only truly analyze after the fact. It's like the word experience. You can't have experience until you've actually experienced something. You can't theorize an experience. It has to take place. So when you don't get something that you want, musically for instance, and you're playing and it doesn't go as well as you might like it to, don't blame others. Have a long, hard look in the mirror at you. You are the one that has to take responsibility for those actions. And a famous story that I like to tell is that I got, I got the bug to want to be a soloist when I was 17 years old. And I was watching television, CBC TV came on, and I saw Jamie Somerville, James Somerville, who's now Principal Horn in the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and Guy Few, who was a brilliant trumpet player and pianist who now teaches at uh, Laurier in, uh, in Guelph. And they were the two finalists. They were a little older than me, and I was watching them as a high school kid, and I saw them play in front of the orchestra, and I was hooked. I just said, that's what I want to do. I didn't know how to do it, but that was the, the, the path that I went on from the age of 17. And what I did from 17 until my mid-20s, I did, I'm very proud to say this in fact, no fewer than, I counted it up once, 40 solo competitions. Four, zero. I am absolutely convinced that nobody in the history of solo competitions has done as many solo competitions as I have from local, regional, provincial, national, continental, to international, 40. And if you do the math over a seven, almost an eight year uh, competition phase, you can do the math in terms of how busy I was finishing one and moving on to the next. The reason I tell that number is not so much to, to boast about the fact that I, that I did 40, it had to do with the fact that I lost most of them. So the idea was not to, you're always approaching it as though you would like to try to win something. There are metrics involved. How did you do? How did you not do? But you only learn something on the back end. I'm very fond of telling students uh, in this phase of their careers that you only really learn something when you lose, when you don't get what you said you wanted. Because that feeling sucks. If you don't have an emotion about it, then you probably weren't that interested in really trying to to do something at an emotional and truly a deep musical level. And you'll find a way to justify that by being unemotional. If you have no emotions about it, you're really missing the point of the arts because we are here as with actors and great dancers, for instance, when you watch great dance, these people are expressing their entire bodies. The artistry comes from knowing exactly that they are connected physically through, through dance, through speech and physicality if you're an actor, and certainly musically if you play a trumpet or any other instrument for that matter. So how you transmit that message is the essence of who we are. So when you don't get what you want, that's when you learn. When you win something, that is simply an affirmation 
that whatever work you put in for whatever that was, whether it was small, medium, large, doesn't matter what the, the, the attempt was, if you did well and you were the winner, add a boy, add a girl, whatever you want to do about it, that's an affirmation. It's when you don't get it that you sit back and should ponder, what can I do differently next time? And there's always something you can do differently. The beauty of music is there's no shelf life. You're always learning. There's a very uh, great story I like to tell about my, my, my father. I called him from, from doing the Montreal Symphony Concerto Competition. And I think I was 23 and there was a flute player, Joanna Gaffrere, who many of you may know because she's one of the greatest flute players in the world and is now principal flute of the National Arts Center Orchestra. And we were both students in Montreal. I think Joanna was 18, I was 23. We both played in the finals. Everybody said it was apples and oranges, could have gone either way. Who won? Not the trumpet player, the flute player. And I felt so robbed, so robbed because it was like, everybody said it could have gone one way or the other. This was my last year of eligibility. She was so young and so talented. She had four or five more chances. It didn't seem fair to me that she would get it when everybody said it could have tipped one way or the other. So of course I called my father and I'm talking to him and I'm pouring out my heart because I'm very disappointed. And at the end of my speech, once I finished all of this unfairness, oh, how terrible it was, he's listening and he finally just said, well, it wasn't obvious enough that you was a winner. Next time practice more, don't complain to me. Boom, that would be a mic drop or a telephone. You can choose. He hung up on me. Wish that was a joke, but it wasn't. It was also one of the greatest and most loving lessons of my life. And it was done spontaneously and it was honest. He was basically saying, who cares? Get on with it. You didn't feel you played well enough to be the one that was ultimately remembered? Then analyze what you did. And as I said earlier, what you didn't do. That's a key element to improving on your instrument, both as a musician and then just as an artist in terms of how you're presenting your art from the stage, and perhaps most importantly, a human tenet about getting to know yourself so that you can make others uh, bask in the glow of who you are. And I say that without ego. That is simply, you want to try to be the kind of person that other people want to be around. That's transmitting love and positive energy. And if that's not your mission as an artist, get out of the arts, do something else, be a bean counter, go into accounting. There's no emotion in money. You simply move beads around from here to there, okay? That can be your nine to five job and you'll be very, very happy if you have no emotions, okay? But when you wanna be an artist, you have to seek a deeper place. And that's where it gets um, not difficult, it gets tricky perhaps, you could say it that way. But I choose, because I'm an optimist by nature, to think that that is the essence of why we do it at all. Okay, getting to know yourself. Fast forward from, from those 40 solo competitions, I started doing uh, quite well a few big international ones and, and uh, won a couple of big contests in one year, one in Prague and uh, the Ellsworth Smith, which was a big trumpet competition and uh, felt like, okay, I have finally arrived. Where's the record deals? Where's management? It's gonna be golden streets and gold hummers from now on. Count me in, the gigs to be pouring like rain from heaven. Uh, that's not exactly what happens, okay? When you do really well at these things, you are noticed by your own community. The trumpet community will say, bravo. You might get a feature article in the ITG journal. You might get featured at the, oh, that's International Trumpet Guild for the handful of oboists who accidentally have signed on to this particular broadcast. You'll get recognition within the community, but that doesn't translate into a, a career or gigs even, okay? In fact, trust me, Trumpet players will not give you gigs. They will be the ones sneaking in for free. Hey, you could slide me a little ticket for this, right? Yeah, I got you. And you got me on the other end. Yeah, that's right. That's how it works. So if we're trying, and this is actually all kidding aside, and then I'm gonna start talking about horns. It's a very important thing to actually joke around about because there's truth to all humor. If we understand fully that ultimately trumpet players will not get you work and help support you in a holistic sense, what we really also are trying to understand that it's not trumpet players we are trying to impress. We are trying to get rid of the stereotype of what the instrument is thought of as being. Trumpet players are people we learn from and we learn our entire lives. We learn from players who are better than us. We learn from players who are worse than us. The whole point is to see all of it as information that you can apply to ultimately make yourself better. But the artistic mission should be to think beyond our community. 
How do we approach playing on stage? How do we approach playing the instruments? How do we approach making music so that we start to debunk and demystify the entire stereotype of what people think of as the trumpet? So let's talk about that for a second. What do you think? What do you really think people think of the trumpet outside of our community? And most people that are watching this right now are in our community. There's a reason they shove us in the back row of the orchestra. We are to be seen and not heard until the last 90 seconds of a major symphony. Then they open the cage, they drop the raw meat on the floor and say, Brass, bring us home! But for the first hour, keep it cool. We'll give you a few little spots to make your moment, but you're not to be there until the very end when we want to raise the volume level and get the chills up so high that everybody feels like, oh, I can't believe that concert, spectacular. But they put us in the back row for a reason, okay? It was that very reason that we were in the back row of the orchestra. That is how the Canadian Brass was formed. They were all spectacular players playing in the back row of the Hamilton Philharmonic who were trying to figure out well, how do we get to the fun front part of the stage? We want to be in the front row. And they left their orchestra careers and started the Canadian Brass, which is what happened after I finished my solo competition career. Uh, the Canadian Brass called me and I had six wonderful years of touring with them. It wasn't in the game plan. These were heroes of mine when I was a kid. I admired them and still do. Uh, but you don't aspire to a career in the Canadian Brass. It's just, you just don't think something like that's even possible. It happens when the timing is right, when you are prepared and all of a sudden there's an opportunity uh, that comes up. And it went my way that particular time. And one of the great things that I learned about the Canadian Brass career, and it's a very, very important tenet of how I run my, my, my educational life now in terms of students and how I disseminate information to them, and also how I play the trumpet. The Canadian Brass started their career not playing in Carnegie Hall or at the Hollywood Bowl or at the Suntory Center in Tokyo, or wherever they are in the world, and we played all of those big halls, they did over 200 children's shows a year, all around southwestern Ontario, sometimes three, four hits a day, 30, 40 minute hits. You do a concert, there's a period break, more kids come to the gymnasium, you go to the next school, you do the same thing. And here's what they learn about the attention span of children. Children have no attention span. Zero, less than zero, okay? And when a child is bored, they will not be polite. They will look the other way. They won't even pretend to be caring about you. They'll just be plain, flat out rude. They start talking to their neighbor. What Canadian Brass realized is that if they can find a way to hold the attention of young children, that same formula works with adults, okay? And adults actually pay to go to concerts and they pay to support careers. And well, they used to pay to buy CDs and albums, but that's another conversation since that's not really happening anymore. But they were the ones that would pay to support a career. Now that concept is based on a very, very simple idea, as I mentioned a little earlier, about sharing something with an audience instead of feeling like you have to impose it on them. And this is a really, really important tenet to remember because it's sort of the essence of how that mystical communication takes place between arts and patrons. And that transaction, literal and figurative, has to take place. So it was a great uh, learning ground for, for how to play a concert and feel like you were doing something for the audience instead of feeling, well, we have something to prove to them, okay? This is where we come to the stereotype of brass instruments and why I'm gonna get quite excited to tell you some geeky stuff about these horns. Outside of the brass world, they see us in the back row, they see us as loud, and obnoxious and we play in the marching band, they do not see us as artistic entities. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the sad, overall, overarching stereotype of a trumpet. We are to be heard from far away, but that's about it. Now, we're not gonna get into the minutia and argue it because of course we know that's not true. I'm just talking about your general neighbor. You ever seen somebody? You know, it's usually a, a, a drunk uncle at Thanksgiving and they'll grab a horn and say, let me have a go at that. And what they'll do is, yeah, I've got a sound on it. We've all heard it, we've all been there. And we just sort of smile and say, yeah, uncle, why don't you take a break right now? That'd be great. Because that's what they're trying to do. How can you make this blaring noise? The first thing that comes to mind is not, how can I play something really beautiful and intimate and sing 
How many of you have ever heard the term sing through your instruments? Oh, we've heard it so much. I'm tired of hearing it. I just want to play my horn. Got news for you. If you cannot sing it, you cannot play it. Not on a trumpet. You don't even have the right to play it. That's how hard I go on that concept. I don't care what your singing voice is, but you've got to be able to sing something on pitch at least for the, the passage that you're going to be playing. And if you can't match pitch to ear and vocalize that, as I said, you don't have the privilege of this. If you truly cannot hear and match a pitch with voice, go play the piano. You know, you touch a note and it's a right note or it's a wrong note. Trumpet doesn't work that way. So we have to have imagination before we even start playing about how we want to sound. And again, that stereotype of the instrument Whatever it is, it's like fanfare time, let's go. Whatever it happens to be, it's like charge call time. That's what people expect when you grab a trumpet. But if you can grab an instrument and start thinking about it in a manner that really says, I'm here to actually vocalize what I hear in my head. I want it to sound beautiful, not blaring. There's a time for us to blare. There's a time for us to play you know, lead trumpet and ride over top of the section. There's an excitement to that. But it's the other side of the instrument that we want to start getting imaginative with. out of that state. I'm not sure how that translated over the internet, but in my mind, you all didn't exist. Nothing existed. I tried to just give myself over to the trumpet for 15 or 20 seconds playing the opening of Charlie A2 and get lost in that, not worried about what was coming up, not worried about what I did. Just stay in true present time. Once you start learning how to do that, then you start learning how to improve on your instrument. You start learning how to play honestly for an audience, that includes when you chip a note. It's going to happen. Deal with it, don't get paralyzed with it. I'm very fond of saying to students, if they miss something at a concert and they freak out, I'm always fond of saying, listen, you probably have a family that loves you and cares for you. And if you, if you don't have that, you have far bigger problems with the fact that you missed a high C. Yeah, right. We all joke around about that lick, but that's because we're terrified of the fact that what if we miss an octave? What if we miss something? And those are concepts that will become reality if that's where you put your emphasis, okay? All right. Um, a lot, I, you can probably tell I can go on about this philosophically for hours. I will not. I'm going to turn the, the tide just for a moment and start talking about some of these, these beautiful Yamaha instruments that I have. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to take my... These cool reading glasses that I got once I turned 50. Oh, nice question. There's the first one. Keith Deavy. Is that a picture of Dizzy behind me? No, it's actually Louis Armstrong. Thank you for asking. Louis got my back. That's how I like to think of that one. Um, now, let's talk a little bit about horns, okay? And please, get some questions going. I'm seeing Adam there, and he's not dropping anything into my chat room except the question about whether that's Dizzy or Louis Armstrong. It's Louis. This is one of my, uh, this is my C trumpet. Uh, Yamaha has made a lot of different C trumpets uh, over the years in terms of uh, their, their research and development. And this is the one, it was uh, affectionately called the, uh, the Chicago, uh, the first generation of the Chicago model C trumpet. And because I've been playing Yamahas for, boy, I don't know, 35, 40 years, basically since high school, I've seen a lot of different developments. I personally loved this particular instrument. And now there are a number of iterations. Some of them I'm really not as on top of. There's certainly a New York model. I know the Boston Symphony has uh, models of the Yamaha. There's been a generation one, two, and three, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. I can see Adam, he can't talk to me, but just nod your head if that is correct. Yes, he's nodding. So that my, my fearless assistant has told me, yes, there are three different iterations of the horn. Here's the cool thing about all trumpets. As I go through this little uh, parade of instruments, and hopefully you can ask questions about them, uh, find the one that basically feels good to you. Uh, a really awesome company like Yamaha, and I say awesome because of their consistency. They're going to make horns that are ultimately, which ones you try are going to be very, very close to being identical to each other. 
So the great thing about that is that you could start to, to trust that whichever instrument you pick up, uh, it will be reliable to you in a consistent sense. If you pick up a number of different ones, you're going to start learning things about how you play and not the instrument. The instrument shouldn't be telling you, you should be telling the instrument what you want to do. Anyway, I sort of dug this particular uh, model. That's the, it's the C trumpet that I've played for, for quite a while, really, really since Canadian brass days, and uh, uh, a wonderful horn. So definitely one to check out. Now I'm going to move through here and pull out a few other instruments. Now this one is one I've also had for quite a while. And this B flat is one of the standard, i got to read the, the serial number on it because they change from year to year, the, the 8335, all right? which is a, I call this a spectacular workhorse. And I mean that in the best possible sense. Not too bright, not too dark sounding. It sort of is really reliable in a lot of different kinds of settings. And uh, it's been one of the great uh, workhorses of the, uh, the instrument line that Yamaha has made. Um, my personal preference, incidentally, because people do ask me uh, about why I like certain horns, uh, in terms of, of bore sizes, etc., I have always gravitated toward medium-large equipment as opposed to large bore instruments. Believe me, I have tried all of them. I've gone from starting on a box 7C mouthpiece all the way to using box sizes, one and a quarter uh, C with a Schmidt back bore, 24 throat, big, big sort of standard orchestral gear. And I've come to the conclusion over the years that most people, we'll touch on this briefly uh, for just a moment, play mouthpieces that are generally too large. Uh, I'm not really a fan of saying play the biggest mouthpiece possible. I'm also not a fan of playing the smallest mouthpiece possible. There's sort of a middle ground that I think we should all ultimately gravitate toward because you can do a lot of things in different directions. If you truly only commit to one direction of size, you start to limit your possibility to come out of that vein. And I'm, I'm really, really big in encouraging all players at all levels to be open-minded. One of the beautiful things about our horn is that we play everything. We don't just play classical. We don't just play jazz. We don't just play pop. We don't just play lead. We don't just play funerals. We don't just play weddings. We do everything. All styles of music are open to us. So why wouldn't we, instead of just focusing on one specific thing, stay as open-minded as possible? The rest of it will take care of itself as you start going down particular rabbit holes, as I call them. So, but I wanted to start with this one, the 8335, a really, really awesome uh, stock instrument to uh, play on B flat, which kind of leads me to one of my more interesting colored horns. Well, this is by Yamaha Mark II. This trumpet was actually my high school instrument. I bought it in high school in the early to mid 80s, okay? And of course, it doesn't come painted blue and, uh, and crimson, you know, from the, the factory. This is a little bit of aftermarket technology. I did it for fun uh, because, as you can see, I like to play a lot of different instruments. And my concerts are often, and there's a method to this madness. In, in case you're wondering, I'm not just here to talk trumpet specs. Like when I do a concert as a soloist, I intentionally have four or five different instruments that I bring out on stage. I intentionally commission composers to write for at least three instruments. Minimum of two, three is preferred, and four is possible. If they want to throw in a fifth, great, let's do it. I do not, I will not, play a new composition where the composer looks at me and says, you know, I really theorize this is a C trumpet piece. I have a real orchestral idea of the colors. Like, stop talking, okay? Let us as artists define what we want to see happen. So even if they've written it for one instrument, I'll make an instrument switch in the middle of it. Now, why do I do that, you might ask? Because, and this is very important, audiences listen with their eyes as well as their ears. So especially when you're doing new modern music, if you can engage the audience visually by grabbing a different horn, all of a sudden we have their full attention. They're going to hear a different tone quality. They're going to hear you holding something different. They're going to watch you moving. And that's what... As a soloist, it's a really, really important tenet to remember because we want to engage them. So as a result of having a lot of different horns on stage, I had this one painted blue because my favorite TV show is called Pimp My Ride. It's a show about cars. I like cars too. And so I had it painted this multiple color. And then right here on the bell, hopefully you can see that, it says Cancer Blows. And for those of you that know me, you'll know that I'm also very, very actively involved with an organization called Cancer Blows which was started by my dear friend and colleague from the Canadian Brass and later the All-Star Brass, Mr. Ryan Anthony, 
who had to deal with a, with a horrible cancer and unfortunately just passed away uh, last June after a number of years of, of battling this. Um, the beautiful thing that Ryan left behind was the legacy, not only of his life, but of the power of music. So I had this emblazoned on the horn to draw attention to the instrument and the cause because the cause of cancer blows in particular has raised literally millions of dollars and awareness all around the world, not just for research uh, in terms of dealing with this horrible plight that we have to address on this planet, but also and perhaps most importantly, the importance of the symbiotic relationship, as I said earlier, between artist and patron or audience. We play these concerts and raise all this money, bring all these superstar trumpet players on stage. The audience doesn't even see it coming. Like it's not as simple as saying, you're here, cancer's bad, please write a check. It's more about saying we're celebrating life. And that's what Ryan did for all those years with his organization. And that's why I painted it on the bell, which trust me, has nothing to do with the Yamaha specs in Hamamatsu. But I've been playing Yamahas for so long. And of course the company and everybody that knows me understands why this horn is on stage. It gets us to talk about the instrument and, as I said, causes. And that needs to be a really, really important aspect of why you want to play music. I promise you, it'll change the way you practice, okay? Anyway, that's my high school Mark II, and it looks cool, I think. Now, I'm going to pull a few other B-flat trumpets out here for you. Uh, this is an interesting horn. This is the uh, LA um, model of the, the, the Yamaha LA uh, custom model which was designed with Wayne Bergeron, who I believe you just had on at this Long and McQuaid, McQuaid Long and McQuaid, try saying that eight times fast, uh, about a month ago. And of course, Wayne is one of the most celebrated lead trumpet players in history. Uh, he's also a very good friend of mine. And uh, this particular horn, uh, this is actually a very special one. I like to bug Wayne uh, that this doesn't even say LA on it. I don't know how close I can get that, but instead of LA, it says WB because this is a prototype. His initials are on this one. And I said, yeah, Wayne, I got the first one before you even did. He likes to joke around right back at me. Yeah, with the prototypes. They hand that out to a lot of the lesser players, you know, to sort of get the bugs ironed out. And then once you go uh, professional and ready to sell, then I get right my final horn. But it's a, it's a really inter interesting instrument, which was a takeoff from the incredibly popular Bobby Shoe model that a lot of people uh, have played in the Yamaha family. It's a very interesting horn as well. Bobby's horn has, has been around for a long time and is super special and really, really fantastic. And they wanted to have sort of a, uh, an alternative idea toward that general direction. So it's a horn that responds very quickly. Uh, it has um, a richness to the mid register sound, but then of course it's a heat seeker in the upper register, but not with what I call the, the intense uh, blaring kind of sound that sometimes we as trumpet players like, but most audience members, quite frankly, simply find offensive. We want to try to keep, even at the heat seeker level, our sound as round and warm as possible. So this is a wonderful instrument. You'll probably, some of you might have noticed uh, a simple change, simple difference between the two. Right on the lead pipe, you'll notice this one has two supporting stems, and the Yamaha, the, the LA model, does only have one. All of these braces, all these little touches are little things that affect uh, the response of the instrument, the feel of the instrument. Every instrument is good, but they have very, very subtle differences in feel. And that's the, the fun part of the journey of trying to figure out which horn is interesting for you. Uh, I'm going to see oh, all of a sudden there's questions in the chat room. Hang on. Let me put on my, let's see, how to choose a mouthpiece. Carolyn, we're going to get there. Naomi Higgins, any advice for woodwind players looking to learn trumpet? That is an excellent question. I'll get to that too. Strategies to encourage second or third year trumpets in band class. And John Granger, hey, thanks for doing this. Thanks, John, for loving it. Okay. And then uh, how would you define a perfect one hour practice routine? All excellent questions. Okay. Uh, we're going to get to the mouthpieces in just a moment. Let me do a quick parade through the B-flat trumpets first of all that being the LA model. Here's another interesting one that I have in my arsenal. And uh, this is based on the uh, New York model of the Yamaha custom model, but this is the Alan Vizzuti model. And um, <laughs> an interesting bit of trivia, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I believe only 1,000 of these horns were actually ever built of the Vizzuti model. We can get the exact stats later, but I'm pretty sure it was 1,000. Uh, that being said, I also know for a fact that there are now only 999 on the planet. 
Um, I was that guy who foolishly somehow was not paying attention and I left a gig bag behind my car. In that gig bag was a Vasuti horn and Dodo Bird here forgot the horn was there and yes, I'm going on camera and I'm admitting to it, I backed up over my own trumpet. It was one of the saddest days of my life. Fortunately, we re-embraced with another horn and I only mention it as a form of subtle humor because if you do ever come to Los Angeles, please make a point of checking out the Yamaha Atelier where Bob Malone is one of their chief designers. He has that particular trumpet on his workbench. It's been there for about 15 years and he gives people this great tour of the whole building and he always ends at his workbench with this completely destroyed trumpet. And people are like, what's that horn? And Bob takes tremendous delight in telling them, let me tell you about not only the horn, but whose horn that was and how this happened. So anyway, it's a great instrument. Uh, I, first of all, anything Alan Vizzuti does or says, we should all do. Okay, he's pretty much a master of everything when it comes to playing the instrument. And certainly if he's going to put some words and thoughts into designing a horn, uh, it will be, it'll be worthy. So that's that particular horn. Um, reaching back here. And oh yeah, I wanted to show you one other uh, B flat trumpet. This is um, the one non Yamaha instrument that I have up here. But I wanted to bring it up uh, specifically because as I talk about these other horns, it'll make sense. Uh, this is actually my Canadian brass uh, B flat trumpet. It's the horn that I played. We, we actually played Yamahas for five of my six years with the group. And there was a one year window where the Canadian brass were developing their own instruments. Uh, and this particular horn uh, was the last one uh, that uh, before we switched back to playing Yamahas. I was able to keep this. It was a great keepsake, of course, too, because it says Canadian brass on the bell. And what was neat about this particular instrument, I never forgot that, and that's what we're going to talk about here in a minute, were the ergonomics. And that's going to be a very, very important word to talk about because the way this instrument was designed, it's a, the, it's a, a traditional looking horn, but it doesn't have the same forward tip. The weight balance point is brings the bell up just ever so slightly, so it feels a little bit more floaty in the hands. I don't know how else to describe it. That's not even really a word, but I think you understand. Not only is that really super important to realize, and not just so much from the design standpoint, but if you don't happen to play one of these horns, the way we hold and play any instrument, even a regular one, to simulate the idea of ergonomics, meaning that you want to bring the horn back to you. What we don't want is for the horn to tip forward and be braced going down. So to get to one of the earlier questions, talking about second and third year trumpet students that are in a band class, here's a couple of super quick tips to give those kids that will make them better players instantly. I promise you, this is not my first rodeo. First thing is get them to get their backs away from the back of a chair. I can't really demonstrate it here, um, and it wouldn't make much sense over Zoom, but every time I do this in a master class, uh, it is an astounding difference. If I take an instrument, and uh, what I'll do is I'll play with my back against the chair. I'll do everything correctly in terms of my breath. And play this little fanfare up to a high F, and people go, wow, that's amazing. And then what I do is I move to the very front of the chair, no back. And I'm sitting there at the front, the way I like to describe it is you want to have the students feel like they're about to stand up and play a solo. That's how you should be seated in a chair. Once your back is against the back of the chair, you've now cut off all ability for your body to resonate. And remember, sound frequency goes not just this way, it also vibrates backwards. That's why the first thing we teach kids, don't lift your shoulders, don't get tight up here. This is breathing 101, okay? Don't do that. But why would we stop there? You want to bring that to the rest of the body. So for young kids, the simplest way to do it, um, and again, I wish I could demonstrate this when we have real time again, and you see me in a master class in person, if I don't do it, ask me to demonstrate, because I'll play that same arpeggio with my back away from the back of the chair, sitting at the front, and I do nothing different. I play the exact same scale. It is at least 20 times more resonant. It's more present. Everybody is convinced that I'm doing some kind of a Jens Lindemann trick here to fool them so that I don't forget about don't sit at the back of the chair. And I'm telling you, as I sit here, every time I do that demonstration, I'm stunned. I'm just, and I'm the one teaching it. I know what's going to happen. It is one of the simplest things that we can teach what I call the ankle biters, young kids. When your hands go up as a director, 
get them to sit to the front of their chairs. When the hands go down, I don't care how they sit. You probably don't care how they sit. Let them sit back and relax. But the position, the proper position they need to learn to get into right away is the front of the chair as though they were going to stand. Okay? That also prevents them from locking down into that fearful position. You know, you're sitting in the back of band class. And you're trying to play something. These kids are squeaking out this, that, and the other as opposed to trying to play something resonantly as though they were saying it in a fancy sort of a way like on the radio or they're about to sing. Anyway, a super simple tip. Get them away from the backs of the chairs. The other thing you want to do, with kids especially, they will have a tendency often to reach out to the instrument. And this is where I come back to the point of ergonomics, why that Canadian brass horn was the first time that light went on. And we'll talk about that with these other instruments in just, uh, just a quick second. So what you want to do is get them to sit forward, uh, have their chest up. I like to describe it as having a, I got a cup of coffee here, but imagine this is a glass of water. And you're balancing here on the top of your chest. And if your chest tips forward, that water, or the coffee in this case, is going to tip forward as well. You don't want that. If the chest is up, what happens to the shoulders? All of a sudden, my shoulders roll right back into position. So you don't have to tell kids, pull your shoulders back. That's unnatural as well. It's just how you get them seated properly in the chair to bring this part of the chest up. Your shoulders will roll into place. That's all you got to do. It ain't rocket science. Okay? Then, the next step, when they're at the front of the chair, they want to feel, and incidentally, I don't care what instrument they're playing. If they're playing the French horn or the tuba or the euphonium, it is the exact same thing. If it's a wind instrument, you want to involve your whole body. So you want to teach them, regardless of what the instrument is, to start uh, seating themselves and preparing to play in a way that makes them feel like they're mobile and flexible. Sometimes I describe it as being in a giant vat of jello. As odd as that sounds. Just imagine you're safe there, you're not drowning, and jello smells good, so you feel pretty good down there, but your motions are inhibited, yet they're fluid. And that's the exact state you want to get kids in right away. And talking about a big fancy word like ergonomics sometimes gets their attention. Okay? So backs away from chairs, this part of the chest up, draw the chin in. The way I describe that is radio voice. That's all you want to be thinking about. Draw that in. Whatever it takes to create a nice radio voice, you're probably in a very close to correct position. And then bring the trumpet back to you. Let the instrument feel like it's floating in your hands and not like you've got a death grip on the horn. Okay, Those are things you can teach kids right away. And if they assume that's what feels natural, then doing anything to the contrary, by definition, will feel unnatural. And that's why we can fix those little, little bad habits really early on. Because by the time they get to me at college, I spend half my time undoing problems as opposed to giving them new tips. It's more like, wow, this is what you've been doing for so long that you're unaware of it. Okay? Very important concept. While I was holding this other instrument, this is a fun one to talk about. I, didn't, I forgot I had one more B-flat. I got so many B-flat trumpets, too many. This is the uh, reverse lead pipe B-flat trumpet that I also played in Canadian brass for quite a while. And the concept very quickly of reverse lead pipe is that this tube up here is literally reverse on this horn versus uh, the regular bracing. And what that does is it actually changes the point that you have your, your, your long lead pipe here. And the first point of interruption where, this, where the, the, the tube actually starts, uh, uh, the airflow is interrupted, is further down here. On a regular horn, it's a little closer. And as a result, these kinds of reverse lead pipe instruments, whether it's Yamaha, I know Bach may, makes one, I think it's called the Vinda Boda model. Either way, the reverse lead pipe setup makes a horn feel uh, a lot smoother. And smooth can be good, but the other can also be good. The, the, the nice thing about a smooth feeling horn is that once you switch into different registers of playing, there's a smoothness to it that actually is very, very pleasant. And I enjoyed that for a long, long time. I've gone back to a more traditional setup because the advantage, uh, and again, I hate to say advantage or disadvantage, it's not that. The difference with a, a regular uh, setup is that you feel what I call a little bit of the bump. There's a little more resistance earlier on. So when I play, And I try that on a regular horn, just those two notes. And 
it's hard to describe, and until you have the two instruments in your hand, um, it makes more sense once you're doing that. You literally feel as though the sound uh, responds a little sooner because of this point of resistance. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about in our little chat today, is that resistance is not your enemy. Resistance is your friend. Learning how to work with resistance correctly will help your playing in so many ways. So there's times when this smooth feeling is like really awesome and times when you want a little bit more of what I call the bump. It feels a little bit more like the instrument slots. Um, and again, they're just, you know, it's like, do you like, do you like chocolate or do you like strawberry? They're both great. We love both ice creams. Some days you have a different taste for one over the other. But that's one of the things to consider when, when approaching reverse lead pipe instruments, okay? That's a lot of B-flat talk, and I see more questions being fired at me in cyber world. Okay, what do I think of Monet trumpets? Okay, next question. I'm just joking. Calm down, everybody. Stop laughing in cyber world. Uh, my, my honest thoughts about Monet trumpets is this. When Monet trumpets came along, and I'm old enough, kids, to know when they came along, uh, what was awesome about Monet and what he did with his instruments is that he was taking places to um, a design level that made everybody sit up and pay attention. Whether you like the horn or don't like the horn, I've always respected the fact that Dave Monette went his own way and he has created his whole thing and that's cool. I think that's actually really awesome. Now, of course, because there's no one way to do anything, it also made everybody else sort of sit up and take notice and say, well, how do we want our particular horns to evolve uh, down the road? So I'm being diplomatic about it, but I'm actually being very honest. I have respect for it. It's not my particular taste. I think they're very, very interesting instruments, though I do. Okay, so let's continue. All right, let's see. What do we got? Uh, have I played with rotary valves? Yes, we're going to get to that in just a second. Uh, let's see. French horns sometimes have the ability to unscrew the bell for tonal change. Is that something ever, uh, that makers of trumpets have tried? The answer is yes, I think, but with limited... Uh, probably limited success, to be honest, because if it was successful, you'd probably see a lot more trumpets that had screw bells. I've seen it a few times, um, but again, like I said, people are, you know, from Dave Monette to, to all the cool things that Yamaha's doing, there's a lot of very creative minds out there, uh, and a screw bell on a trumpet, if it was really successful, we'd see a lot more of it. So I don't think it's as effective in our case. Um, Quite frankly, one of the reasons that a screw bell was, was even designed was just the convenience of being able to pack a horn differently. And I can promise you that was one of the motivations. There wasn't some incredibly highbrow artistic or scientific thought that went into the overtone series. That's a byproduct, but you're getting into a landmine here. Once you cut a bell on a horn, what kind of metal do you use to brace it again? The thickness of that, the, the, the material that you use, I mean, it's a, it, it's a minefield. Literally, like there's a gazillion options. So again, I try to keep it fairly simple. It hasn't really been done on trumpet, okay? Let's take a couple of questions, then I'm gonna to get to some of the smaller horns uh, that I have up here. As a struggling beginner, do I have to start with C trumpet or can I start with a different pitch? I struggle with the C trumpet sound. I'm uh, Yananai, I don't know exactly how to say your name, apologies, but it looks like a wonderful Japanese name. Apologies for not being able to say it correctly. I'm assuming you just mean uh, the, the pitch, or perhaps you're talking about playing a C trumpet versus the C trumpet sound. If you're talking about different instruments, B flat trumpet versus a C trumpet, first of all, get over it. They're different instruments and, and we respect them as such, but one does not inhibit the other. They don't. They enhance each other if you think about it correctly. When we get into the small horns, we're going to talk about that as well. So don't be afraid to try C trumpet, they're great. Uh, let's see, all right. Um, okay, oh Moeen, did you start on trumpet or piano? First of all, I'm gonna answer this question because the great Moeen is a dear friend of mine and we were in university together. Interestingly, I did start on piano. Uh, I was eight years old taking Royal Conservatory. I made it all the way to grade five and then I quit and I started trumpet. And that's about my level of piano playing now, but yes, I can sort of thumb through things, that's for sure. Uh, okay. Excellent. Uh, the, the first move, that, Adam, just nod, you mean the first one that I sent you? Or the not the second one, which is still not happening? Perfect, the first one. Great, thank you for that. 
Okay, let's move on, kids, because we pretty much covered all the B-flat horns. Oh, the last B-flat trumpet I'll show you very quickly is my cornet. Now, the reason I want to show you the cornet, the cornets are all beautifully designed. Everything is great. I had a special lever built right here on the end. It's actually, you don't necessarily have to have, it's just a, 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 a post-production thing that, um, you know, it helps me em empty the water very quickly when I want to. But also, interestingly, um, when you get an A on top of the staff or even a high F, I don't have a cornet mouthpiece with me right now. Sometimes opening up a particular uh, a, a valve, pardon me, a spit valve, sometimes helps slot it in slightly different ways. We're getting into sort of very advanced uh, forms of feel and intonation, but it's important to at least mention because people always ask, why is that on there? And I said, well, the horn is fine the way that it was. I just wanted a few options, and so I kept it on there over the years just to talk about it, okay? The reason we're going to talk about that is because I want to get into some of the smaller horns. Okay, so let's talk about piccolo trumpets. Um, first of all, I'm going to show you, and then we'll get to that Brandenburg clip in just a moment, Adam, I promise. I'm going to show you, this is the rotary valved uh, piccolo trumpet that I helped design with Yamaha. Uh, now this one is the prototype. It's the one that actually never made it to production model, but it was the one that we used for testing, uh, for tonality, etc., etc. Uh, and what was really, really important to me were the ergonomics of how the instrument was made. Often I see people with rotary piccolo trumpets, somebody that asked about rotary horns, and they grab it like it's a piece of meat or something, you know, and some people are comfortable putting one or two fingers or even three fingers on the bell. I personally don't believe in doing that because I think anytime you touch the bell, you're affecting the resonance of the bell. And so my preference is always to have a horn feel like if you want to hold it this way, I don't, but if you want, you have that option. But if you also want to have the option of holding it this way, where you don't touch the bell, you can do that. Now to that end, I mentioned this is the prototype. This became the production model, which looks almost exactly the same, but what's really cool about this is that we can change this thumb ring can be moved and adjusted so that you can now truly customize it for hands. And notice on this version, there is also a ring right here uh, for your middle finger and a second one there. So now you can support the entire weight of the instrument like this without feeling like you need to grab the horn and the bell. That was a critical element of design. I, when I was working with Bob Malone on this, I said, you have to allow the instrument to vibrate as freely as possible. And the only way to do that is not to be touching the bell. All right, again, that's, we'll go into a deeper masterclass on that a different day. But this is a very, very beautiful, exclusive instrument. Um, it's a lot of design and, and work that has gone into making this. Uh, so you, you, it, it is an investment that you have to make, but it's a very interesting, worthy investment. Uh, and probably something I would truly only recommend to people that are quite advanced down the road uh, when it comes to piccolo trumpet playing. Uh, certainly it's available, it can be bought, and it's beautiful, but you don't have to buy a horn like this. It really becomes, um, it's, like, it's like driving a sports car, a really cool sports car. Everybody thinks, oh, I'd love to drive a sports car. Eh, not all the time. There's things that sports cars can do, and you go, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I can corner, and I don't feel any body roll or anything. It just feels right. And when you're into that kind of intricacy, that's where a really interesting advanced horn becomes interesting. But sometimes you just want to get into a bit of a cream puff, you know, that has soft suspension and you don't really feel uh, those kinds of jagged edges. And that's where multiple kinds of piccolo trumpets become very important. Anyway, this is one of the, uh, the really interesting, beautiful advanced instruments in the, the Yamaha catalog and that's their, their rotary piccolo. Where we're going though, and this is the clip I'm gonna show in just a second. Now here's an example of a very traditional four valve piccolo trumpet. Uh, these are the ones you would very often see most people buying as a four valve piccolo. I did when I joined the Canadian Brass. This was the one I picked from Yamaha and I said, yep, that's the one I want. And it seems to make a lot of sense because uh, first of all, there's four valves so you can get down to the coveted low F, which you rarely need. And it also provides some alternate fingerings. Uh, and I played this horn for the longest time. And it's a spectacular instrument, total war horse, pitch is great, feel is great. Nothing wrong with this horn at all. And then, one day, I discovered this one, which I also had the option of looking at when I joined Canadian Brass, but my first instinct was, why would I buy a piccolo trumpet with only three valves? Doesn't make much sense, like I'm missing out on something. 
Well, you're not. Interestingly, this horn was designed by the great Fred Mills, who I replaced in the Canadian Brass. And Fred's concept of piccolo trumpets uh, was that he wanted it to feel like a small trumpet, which a piccolo literally is. It literally means little trumpet. Uh, the idea behind the three valves, though, is that there's an optional rotor, which you can kind of see down here, a rotary valve, which when I open and close that, so if I go to all three fingerings, low F sharp, and then kick open the rotor, I drop it a tone, and I can play that coveted low F. It takes some thinking and a little bit of adjusting to get used to that, but the minute you do, it's like adjusting to a B-flat side or an F side on a French horn, for instance, that has a, a rotor as well to, to switch keys. And this is where we're going to get to the piccolo trumpet clip right now. Why I didn't really consider this trumpet early on was because it had three valves. And again, you're just thinking traditionally, I need four. You don't. This horn has been a really incredible discovery for me because of its flexibility. And that's why we're going to play a little video clip right now uh, of a recording that I released a few months ago, um, which I'm, I'm very proud uh, was just uh, nominated for Juno Awards. So in a couple of months, we'll be up for the, uh, the it's been nominated in the, the best solo and chamber category of the classical recording. And what's interesting about the recording itself, everything on it is a world premiere, so to speak. I recorded the Brahms Trio, Opus 40. I think there was a French horn player on here. So don't call it the Horn Trio, because it's not called that. It's called the Opus 40. And Brahms wrote it for violin, piano, and horn, or cello, or viola. Whoever's lying around can play one of the third parts, okay? Traditionally, horns have played it. It's been called the horn trio. I had a special instrument built with four valves, which allowed me to play in that horn register, and we did that instead of the horn part, which was really, really an awesome thing to do. But I'm talking about this particular piccolo trumpet because we also recorded Brandenburg's second concerto, um, Brandenburg concerto number two, and I'll show you that horn in a minute. But this is where we're going to show you a visual clip of Brandenburg five which is written for violin and flute, and then of course, amazing harpsichord as well. And I wanted to play the flute part on trumpet. Now initially, I thought I was gonna play that on this beautifully designed and this wonderful um, uh, four valve uh, rotary instrument, which has everything you could possibly want in terms of its, its coloristic contribution to the repertoire. The catch was, the way the Brandenburg 5 is written for flute, there's a lot of long sustained playing in the low middle register, and then occasionally you have to go to the extreme high register of the flute. And there were so many intonation issues. Imagine if you're playing with James Ennis on violin, your intonation had better be good because he wasn't gonna settle for anything except as perfect as he could get. And what was cool about this instrument, we'll play this clip here in just a second, is that it gave me options for alternate fingerings, which included this valve for trills, uh, one day I've, I've, I've told people I'm going to actually publish my part from the Brandenburg 5 because there's all these crazy alternate fingerings that you would never use in a million years, but they worked perfectly because it had to work in sync with, and I haven't forgotten this question, the mouthpiece. The mouthpiece that I used to create Brandenburg 5, and then we'll play this, was actually designed for me as an E-flat trumpet mouthpiece. It wasn't designed to be played in the upper register, but it gave this beautiful, warm, flute-like quality. So now when I had to play extremely high, every natural fingering was going to be completely, usually very flat. So I had to come up with creative alternate fingerings, and this horn turned out to be the perfect vehicle. Never would have expected it. So with that rather long introduction on piccolo trumpets, I'd love it if Adam just went ahead and played a little clip of the Brandenburg 5 concerto, uh, which is being played on piccolo trumpet instead of flute, with the great James Ennis and all the principal players from the Montreal Symphony, the National Arts Center Orchestra, and the brilliant John Kimura Parker on harpsichord. Check this out, about a minute and a half.
Hope you enjoyed that. Um, it was really one of the most artistically challenging recordings I've ever done in my life. And I say that as a positive because it was a wonderful challenge to try to rise to the occasion to play with such great artists as the ones you just heard. Um, on April 16th, a little bit of a shameless plug, I'll be doing a live video concert, which you can check out through my, my Facebook page. I imagine uh, I'll thank Long McQuaid for putting a link to it. Uh, but it will be a, a live performance where I bring on the, uh, the producer of that recording and the recording engineer. That would be Steve Epstein and Richard King. Between them, they have 32 Grammy Awards. Uh, Steve has been voted the top classical producer of the year seven times. And Richard King runs the recording program at McGill University. In other words, the best of the best, working behind the glass. And when you do a recording, we all have to respect the talent that it takes people to be back there. We just want to play our instruments, but they're the ones that really create magic. So I'm going to have them on for about 30 minutes to talk about recording techniques, what we thought about to try to attain those sounds, because I was trying to respect the flute in that particular case, uh, the French horn and the Brahms, etc., etc. I think that'll be very interesting for both audiophiles and straight up and down tech heads who want to know about microphones and placement, etc., etc. And then we'll start with the concert proper, which will be uh, some unseen video. And I will also have live James Ennis on violin and John Kimura Parker on piano, two absolute legends. So I know most of you are here wanting to know trumpet stuff, which is great. Thank you for being here. But one of the other things I want to leave you with is if you really, really want to get better as a trumpet player, listen to non-trumpet music. Do that, okay? When I first got to Juilliard and had my very first lesson with Mark Gould, uh, I played for him and he finished, or rather I finished, and he said, who do you listen to, kid? And I gave him my top 10 trumpet list. It was a good list too, and it was fast. I rattled that off and I sat back looking for trumpet approval and he looked at me and he goes, uh huh? Listen, do you listen to any opera? How about string quartets? Do you listen to any woodwind quintet? The problem with you is you're a meathead. Stop listening to that trumpet stuff, start listening to real music and you might make something yourself. Get out. Lesson one, can't make it up, okay? And that was the day I fell in love with him because he was trying to get me to think, to really think. My other first trumpet teacher uh, at McGill, James Thompson, the very first thing he taught me in my first lesson, this is also a great tenet. He looked at me and he said, I am not here to teach you. I'm here to teach you to teach yourself. And boy, did that ever hit it on the head. And it's the first thing I tell all students. Think, come in loaded with questions. Don't just expect a little gold star in your etude book every week. Oh, that's great. That's high school. Get a gold star in high school. By the time you hit college and beyond, start thinking about why, presumably by the time you're at college, you really want to commit down this, this train to see what might happen, okay? So those are very, very important uh, pivotal moments in my life. And um, that will be, as, again, as I said, on uh, Friday, April 16th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern which is 4.30 p.m. on the West Coast. But you can find all that information on Facebook. So thanks for letting me plug that. Appreciate that. Okay, uh, let's move on to a couple of other horns, and then I'm going to look at a few more questions. This is some fun stuff back here. Uh, because I have uh, two E-flat trumpets I want to show you. First of all, this is an E-flat cornet. Uh, I play with the brass band of Battle Creek. It's the only band I play with. Uh, otherwise, I only have solos that I like to perform, and I have my own small chamber groups and a big band. But I play in a, a true brass band, and I play the E flat soprano part. E flat soprano. For any of you that are brass banders, you realize it is a thankless instrument. I don't care who's making it, and Yamaha makes a really good one. The reason it's a thankless instrument is because the part is so exposed, and you are a hero or you are a goat. There's no place to hide in between. So it was a very interesting process for me to. Uh, to get to really try to unlock the secrets of E-flat cornet. Uh, it is a wonderful, wonderful challenge uh, to try to play this instrument properly. And that takes us to this particular E-flat, which was <coughs> the prototype for the production model of uh, their uh, Yamaha's latest E-flat D trumpet. And uh, you can see it sort of has a different kind of lead pipe configuration here. And uh, the rest of it is, uh, as I said, this was a prototype uh, which I have, which led to the production model, okay? Now that takes us forward, the last thing I want to say about E-flat trumpets, to this particular instrument. I wanted to talk about the cornet and the E-flat trumpet specifically to show you this horn. 
which was made for me by Yamaha. There's only one made in the world. You're looking at it, okay? And this is a hybrid instrument between what I call the cylindrical components of the E-flat trumpet, and yet you can see here, there's a cornet-like bell on it, so the conical qualities of the cornet, which tends to be a warm-sounding instrument, and the trumpet part of it is the cylindrical part, which gives us good centering and focus. And the idea of combining the two things together, as well as what I said earlier about ergonomics, this horn, the terms of how it's built and the weight balance uh, situation, when I hold it, it literally, it goes up and down. It doesn't tip forward. As a result, I have this beautiful relationship to the instrument as a true extension of my body. It's very easy to simulate that. Again, if we go back to what I said earlier, you can do that same thing with a regular uh, design horn, which 99% of you would have, but you have to consciously think about it. And when you can make that feel like habit, uh, then when you get into something like this, oh boy, does it ever emphasize, again, ergonomics, meaning that you want it to literally feel like it's an extension of you. You want no resistance. You don't want to be fighting with it. It should literally be uh, a different aspect of your personality and imagination. And this horn was built specifically uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Yamaha were very, very, uh, was very grateful that they built it for me uh, because I did a recording of the Haydn Trumpet Concerto and the Hummel Trumpet Concerto with the Royal Philharmonic and uh, Pincus Zuckerman conducting. The Haydn was written in 1796, which was the beginning of trumpet chromaticism. It was literally written to feature a newly designed instrument which could play diatonically and chromatically. No more fanfares allowed. So that was why the Haydn is ground zero for all trumpet repertoire. That's where it stood. And the Hummel Concerto was the companion concerto written after that. Because it was my, at the time, it was my 25th or 30th year with Yamaha, we did it as a celebration of me being with the company. But I asked them, would you mind building an instrument such as this so we can also honor the unique aspect of the Haydn Concerto in the pantheon of our musical history? The Haydn was so important that I wanted to really honor the work itself with the, the design of a brand new instrument, which was, lies somewhere in between the trumpet and the cornet. Um, and it's a direct result of the awesome uh, production model E-flat trumpet that is already out there in circulation and very, very popular. Okay, so that was uh, an important thing for me to tell you about how I imagine both cornets and trumpets uh, being together. Um, now, we'll touch on, let's touch for a second here on mouthpiece. So I'm just Quickly grab a glance here at what else might be written in there, see if there's any, let's see, oh, difficult to become a soloist. Okay, how difficult is it to become a soloist and what is needed except for practicing? Networking skills, okay? One of my biggest heroes was Tommy Banks. Tommy was a, a senator and a big band leader and a pianist and uh, he had his own company. Then he, he Tommy did everything. Uh, arranger, composer, you name it, Tommy did it. And he taught me in Edmonton when I was growing up he said, there's two words, music, business. You keep that straight, you're going to be okay. Music is what we practice on our own. Business is business. Okay, you want to be a soloist. There is no, I'm very fond of saying, uh, the word trumpet soloist is an oxymoron. Okay, we do not exist on paper. There's no such thing as a trumpet soloist. We have violin soloists. We have piano soloists. But trumpet soloists, we don't, we don't fit the mold. Okay, so instead of thinking of that as a disadvantage, you should think of it as an opportunity because of the fact that there are no expectations of a trumpet soloist other than what have you got that's new and interesting. So if you want to really go down that path, aside from learning to play the instrument, you will really want to hone your networking skills. That's really, really important. And don't think that any of you are above that. And I say that with all due respect. Sometimes artists have a, um, there's a, a form of entitlement that we sometimes feel because we're making great art that we, we're not beholden necessarily to people that don't necessarily like our art. We find all sorts of ways to justify it. And that's just our own ego uh, feeling insecure. You can't have any of that. If you wanna to go to business school, that is rule number one. Business 101, start networking. What's a different word for networking? Be kind to people, be curious. Your friends and colleagues that you're at school with right now, get to know them. Because you're gonna to get to know each other as you go on in professional careers, so that's really, really critical. And be curious in a positive way. Not a, we're not. This isn't a contest. You know, we're we're sort of in this to try to encourage each other to find different ways of, of becoming um, interesting artists. Okay, so that would be my my quick answer to how to become a soloist. 
much longer answer there, but that's a whole other master class, okay? Uh, I assume that you are a fan of Clark Technical. The answer is yes, all right? If you want my, my trifecta of trumpet doom, pardon me, said incorrectly, the trifecta of, of uh, the trumpet nucleus, the Clark study book, the Arbenz book, the Charlier book. Done, peace out, full stop. You work on those three things, you are going to get everything. Clark will definitely cover all of the, the, the technical issues that can be quantified. Okay, when I say quantified, that means you know whether success or failure. You can use a metronome, you must use a metronome. Arbenz covers everything from A to Z, A to Z, if you're Canadian, I don't care. And the Charlier book uh, is quite simply the most musical etude book out there. There are dozens and dozens of others. Yes, they're great, yes, they all have credence, but I'm telling you, if you stick to those three books, you'll have more than you could possibly handle through your entire career. That's where you start, okay? Oh, and incidentally, buy them as books. Don't do ebooks. Yes, I know most of you will do that, but there's something about having a hard copy that you write into and then look at years later. Kids are looking at me like, dude, you're so old. Yeah, maybe. Guess what? I'm also right. Don't argue with me. Trust me. One day you'll be super happy that you actually have something tangible. So buy those. All right, I think I made my point. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, proponent of buzzing the mouthpiece. Uh, yes, I am. So let us talk for a second about, um, about mouthpieces because that question did come up. So for many of you, you've probably noticed I have, um, <clears throat> well, here's a, a very traditional metal mouthpiece. It's gold-plated mouthpiece. And my mouthpieces now are made by Peter Pickett. I started off playing typical uh, Bach mouthpieces, a seven. As I said earlier, I went to a one and a quarter, a big back four. I sort of settled closer around the somewhere between a seven and a five, hovering between a C cup and a B cup so that I could have uh, good focus, uh, but still a deep enough cup that it was a nice resonant sound. And that sort of became my basic approach to middle of the road gear that I could you know, pretty much do anything with. And I played uh, metal mouthpieces my whole career. Uh, enter, a couple of years ago, I had a student, still have a student, she's a very fine player, who has an allergy uh, to metals. And she plays on something that's like made of elk horn or something. I don't even know what it is, but it's not, it's not metal. And she has no allergy issues. And it got me thinking about that. I thought, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, incidentally, incidentally, for those of you playing mouthpieces that are raw brass, or maybe some of you could have acidic lips where maybe the silver has worn off, or you're playing grandpa's mouthpiece because it was you know, given to you and you love the way grandpa played, but it's got no more silver plating on it, don't do it. Do not argue with me about playing raw mouthpieces. It is one of the most dangerous things you will ever do for your trumpet playing. It is so easy to get an infection. And I have at least two friends who almost lost their careers due to the kind of infections from raw brass. It is such a simple fix, get it plated. Okay, if you happen to be one of those players that burns through and you start getting to that raw brass part, get it plated. Please, please don't run into the problem because you, you have very, very strong possibility of doing that. Can't emphasize that enough, okay? And then you have silver mouthpieces, gold plated. So I talked to my mouthpiece maker, Peter Pickett, and he said, well, I make something called polymethyl metacrylate. That is a very, very cool sounding term. It basically means plexiglass, okay? And as a Canadian, of course, I'm a hockey fan. You can't own a Canadian passport without owning a hockey stick or showing proof thereof. It's kind of like, you know, getting your face pushed up against the glass, that kind of a thing. If you're Canadian, you totally get what I'm talking about. What I loved about this was the consistent feel. Uh, it's, a, it's a warmth. I don't know how to describe it. It's a consistency that I have just, I've really been attracted to. Um, and this is all I play. Every one of my mouthpieces is now uh, made of this polymethyl. And I love it. And it's also a screw top rim, so I can change tops and bottoms and, and make little adjustments in terms of how I feel about uh, tonal quality, centering, back door, different pieces that I'm playing. So this has been a really, really fun bit of experimentation. And it comes in all sorts of cool colors. So if you're interested, and incidentally, it's not like typical, when I was coming up, there were, um, it was, ah, I forget the name of it. I think it started with an L. It was a, a material, sort of a white plastic material, and even just full-on plastic. Polymethyl is not that. It's actually a very, very hard material, which transfers vibration very well. So you basically don't really have a loss of overall volume and, and, and quality of sound. Maybe 2 or 3% at the very, very top end, but you, it's, it's not needed. Anyway, I have uh, switched over to these, and 
I don't think I've ever gone back to playing a metal mouthpiece, and I've played one my whole life, but these have been really fun. So hopefully that answers that question, okay? All right, let's see, we got another question here. Let's see, okay. How would I, I uh, let's see. As a woodwind player who uses trumpet, oh, a woodwind player who also plays trumpet, do you have tips? Okay, first of all, don't be afraid to play different instruments. I also hate this argument that if you start playing a different instrument, it will affect your career, perhaps your livelihood on your other instrument. That is such a load of crap. You know when we get into trouble with our chops? When we do stupid things. If you practice stupidly, stupid stuff will happen. It ain't rocket science. There's nothing wrong with the instrument, whether it's this one, or whether it's a euphonium, or a trombone, or you want to double on saxophone, or play the flute. Nothing wrong with those horns. There's something wrong with you if you feel like, now I've damaged something. And that's in your own head. Okay, now with that in mind, all I'm saying is, any of the instruments that are out there that might be a woodwind, uh, switching over and trying to get uh, adept on a brass instrument. And incidentally, for those of you that are going to be educators, you're going to have to learn how to do that. You're going to be demonstrating for 12 year olds. You're going to have to pick up a saxophone, play a scale, and then show them how to do the same thing on trombone. So figure it out and do it intelligently so that you understand again everything I'm talking about, which has to do with efficiency. Try always, the first rule I would give to anybody working on any instrument is try not to play too loud. Okay, when you can learn to, again, if I go back to that demonstration I did a little earlier, because sometimes you get the ankle biters in, in class and they'll play with this pinched little sound. Yeah, woo, I played a double F. And then some meathead beside you says, that wasn't a note, that was like a squeak, man. That wasn't even a real sound. Like, it doesn't sound good. Then you start freaking out because you're insecure. And what do you do? You start blowing harder or with more air. Big mistake, big mistake. What you want to do with any instrument is learn how to do all of those things. And Herbert L. Clark told us that in the early 1900s, don't play loud. If you could do something very easily, and float, even with a little vibrato, make your whole body feel like it's interesting. Now, when I want to step on the gas with that note, I'm already in the perfect position. Now you're gonna use other muscles that we use in extreme cases, okay? Nobody plays loud all the time. If you do, you're being foolish, okay? We play loud when required, which is a fraction of the amount of time. So you have to do it carefully. You would never find a singer screaming at the top of their lungs. Why do we think we should do it any differently? So, to encourage you to work on all different instruments, especially for those of you that are gonna become educators, do it intelligently, not too loudly, and try to make whatever that instrument feel like it's really an extension, again, of your imagination and proper technique, okay? And that starts with the breath in and the breath out. Regardless of what you're playing, whether it's soft or loud, there should be a very easy quality to the breath itself. It should be soft. If I'm gonna do that as a more aggressive fanfare, my breath in is the exact same way. I still have the same fluid motion in my whole body. Now you can't hear it in here, but that was like triple forte at the end. And I'm involving different muscles, but I can only do that because I've learned how to do it gently and easily with my back away from the back of a chair. All right, cool. I think we covered that one. Here's a big question. Let's see. Uh, all right. What I would like to do now is just give you a couple of really super basic tips about practicing um, that I love to give students. First of all, this is in my pocket at all times. Yes, that is a poker chip. If you look at it super close, it actually says, High Roller, Cab Sav. It came off of a bottle of wine, which normally you would think if there's a poker chip in a bottle of wine, uh, it's not going to be very good wine. I got news for you. It is. It's a lovely bottle. And... Uh, I remember meeting a very good friend, and it was our first uh, first lunch together. And over the course of that, uh, that long lunch with a number of people, there were two bottles that had been consumed. By the end of lunch, we pulled them off the bottles of wine, and we kept them as keepsakes. That was the beginning of our friendship. So in other words, this means a lot to me, a lot. It's with me at all times. It's either in my pocket, or it's beside my bed when I'm sleeping, and it's there at all times because I use it to practice, okay? Now, very simply, what I do, you can see this particular poker chip has four obvious sides to it. So I will take that and I will place it on my music stand. That means it's work time. And then I will play something, practice something in short chunks, a very short chunk. 
Okay, that wasn't even a one. That was a zero. One. And then I'll lean forward, turn the poker chip a quarter turn, do it again. That would be two. Quarter turn again. Wrong note, reach down, turn it back a quarter turn. Do it again. And I do that for three complete reps. So that's with four points on the poker chip, that is 12 reps. And I can document my accuracy rate or not. If I screw something up, it either doesn't get turned or it gets turned backwards. And by the time I finish three full reps, I actually have some quantifiable metrics. How many times did I get it? How consistent was I on that particular thing? Just one thing you might want to practice, okay? Why that's really important is two reasons for that. One, I can actually measure my success and failure rate. Two, every time I reach for the poker chip, the horn comes off my face. Teach your kids this. Get the brass instrument off of your chops as often as possible. Anybody that tells you, I found a spot, it's not coming off, I'm gonna screw it into play. I don't wanna lose it. I'm sorry, that is inefficient brass playing. Stop, full stop, we're not gonna debate it. Think logically, okay? Instead of us arguing, should it be on there forever, ever because you found a spot, or should you get used to on and off? Just use logic. When this pushes into your face, you're cutting off blood flow. That's what happens, okay? That's why we eventually get tired and there's no blood flow. You get it off your face, you can simulate the effect on the palm of your hand just by pressing in. When you pull your thumb away, it goes white for a moment and then there's a nice pink fleshiness again, okay? Same thing takes place on your chops. When it's pushed in there, you're cutting circulation off, which means you're actually eventually losing strength. It's just like doing curls, all right? I can do this for as many times and at some point, even just with a trumpet, it's gonna start getting heavy. I'm like, whoa, shake that off, right? Wait a few minutes, do it again. Because you don't get stronger when you're doing something. You get stronger when you're resting. Blood goes into the arms, replaces those, those muscles that have, have been working, have had a workout. And the exact same thing is taking place with your chops. So learn to get it on and off as smoothly and naturally as possible. It all comes back to that earlier concept I said about making the horn feel like it's a true extension of your body. And this silly little poker chip is a great way to practice that habit so I'm instilling good habits without actually thinking about how profound that good habit actually is. Okay? Really, really important tip. Uh, the other thing I like to do is I'll practice in five minute increments. So I'll set a timer for a five minute countdown and I'll practice one little thing. And when the timer goes, I log in another five minutes and we'll continue. And never do the thing you were just doing. Find a new thing. When the timer goes again, maybe go back to the first thing you were doing or do a third thing. Never repeat the same thing. Doesn't matter how close you were to unlocking it. This is about keeping your mind sharp and fresh and engaged. I promise you that if you all do that yourselves, just once, five minute timer, and you do 12 of those, five times 12 would be 60. You will have done the most focused one hour of practicing in your life if you follow those simple rules. Because in order to really get better, you have to be thinking, you have to be monitoring at all times and be engaged. The minute you get bored, you might as well stop playing because you're not getting anything done, okay? Very, very important. Those are two quick tips that you can give all your kids. I promise you, it will help them, okay? All right, let's see if I got another question or two here. Uh, let's see, thoughts about the flugelhorn. <sighs> Look at that. Oh, and Frank Crespo, yes. How do you improve or build the skill of playing in tune? Okay, online trumpet group suggestions. Okay, a lot, of, a lot of cool questions here. First of all, online trumpet group suggestions. There are lots of groups out there. There's one that I like to, uh, to sign up on and that's uh, trumpetherald.com. And it's like a, a site where there's a lot of trumpet geeks there. And I have my own name, but I also have a fake name. I don't do it to troll or be a provocateur. I do it because I'm trying to ask questions for which I really don't have any answers. So this fake name, I had a student almost figure it out, so I changed the account. And then uh, this fake name will often ask questions, and then there'll be six or seven other way geekier people than me that will wade in with answers. And then, of course, two days later, I sign on as Trumpet Dins, and I say, 
you know, I've been considering this concept for quite a while, and I, I've come to the conclusion that I think this is what we should be doing. And then they all go, about, oh, Jens Lindemann, thank you so much for responding. Wow, so glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Are you kidding? I'm the biggest geek ever. I didn't have the answer, but I can't say that I don't have the answer. Except I'm telling you right now, I don't have the answer. All right, that was a long-winded and almost foolish, yet not so foolish way of saying all information is up there. Just ask. So there are other sites like that that you have to imagine. It's like uh, it's like going to a library. Librarians are the weirdest people. They want you to ask them a question. They're sitting there. Please tell me where the science stacks are. Please, please ask me that question. They live for that. They do not live there to have a nine to five job and never want to talk to anybody. Okay. Those kinds of sites are out there for our improvement as well. And it's all just awesome information that you can go through very very quickly. Okay. Uh, that would be one thing I would do. Um, <clears throat> improving playing in tune, uh, there's a couple of ways to do that. Um, and remember, we're talking about two forms of intonation, just intonation and tempered intonation. Just intonation is basically what happens to the piano. When a piano plays an octave or a fifth, that's what's gonna be. In our world of tempered intonation, uh, we might want to adjust where we put the fifth in a chord. We lower thirds, we bring the fifths up. So we have a different way of tuning so that we can attain other overtones in, in brass chords. Because we're single note instruments, we have to consider that. So it's a double-edged answer because if you're playing with piano, there's certain things you have to accept with that instrument that you wouldn't necessarily, that you would definitely not accept if you were playing in a traditional brass context. Long-winded way of say, use a tuner, okay? And I mean use the tuner because, not because you can say, I'm in tune. If you're playing a fifth of a chord and you're pinning the tuner, you may be out of tune. You might want to be 20 cents sharp. But in your own personal practice work, <clears throat> we would all be stunned at how out of tune we tend to play. So if you can learn to play with a tuner and instantly improve your ear so that you can start to really pin it so that it's pretty much close to the middle of anything you try to play, you will not only learn how to correlate a sound in your head with a, a matching pitch that can be proven, you'll also start to learn about the idiosyncrasies of your instrument. All horns, whether it's the instrument or the mouthpiece combination, there's a compromise. It doesn't matter how awesome your Yamaha trumpet is, by definition, and the definition of physics alone, horns are built to be in tune in one way, and then everything after that is the best possible compromise that the designers can think about. That's how acoustics works. That is why we have to have moving slides on instruments. You know, to really get the, the horn at the exact length, this is just science, okay? It's not whether you hear something in tune or not. What is important though is that you have to practice getting your ear to, to trust that what you hear you can play. I had a student a few years ago, he had a spectacular sense of perfect pitch. And I, I looked over one day and I saw his trumpet, he had his trumpet slide in like all the way. No instrument is built to be played in tune when it's pushed in all the way. Every instrument designer accepts that, okay, we're gonna make it sharp when everything is pulled in so that we have some room to maneuver. Well, this kid was playing like spot on and I didn't notice it because of the way I was, where I was sitting in relationship to the bell in his tuning slot. Well, it turns out he has like freaky ears. He heard it and he's like, I don't care where the trumpet says it's gonna be, I'm gonna put it there. And it was always in tune, but even then, I challenged him, I said, Everett, I think it's awesome that you've got like the most amazing ears ever. But the problem is, when you have your tuning slide in that place, just because you're playing it in tune doesn't mean that the horn is resonating as efficiently as it could be. If you move that tuning slide and still play it where your ear wants it to be, there is an adjustment with the instrument itself that also takes place that affects overtones, the core center of the sound. So all of these things have to be factored in when deciding where to place a tuning slide. But it starts with, just play with a tuner. Sing what you're about to play. There's a, a, a lick in a, a very hard contemporary piece um, with Peter Maxwell Davies on it. It's a little crazy. It, was, it sounds kind of like this. This is the wrong key, but you'll hear it's, it's a stupid lick. Like terrorized music, right? And the first time I saw the lick or heard it, I'm like, whoa, that is so hard. Oh, I can't figure it out. Then, I really analyzed it. I realized, wait a minute, that, what I just played, was this. Yay, good old fashioned chromatic scale, displaced by an octave. So once you understood what the actual sound was, that he was just doing a chromatic scale, but intentionally an octave and a semitone, 
Now you could correlate that with something that actually made sense and it became a tonal lick. So working on your ears, working with the tuner, critical, critical. I, I wish I had done even more of it when I was younger. I mean, I had a fair bit, had pretty good uh, ear training instructors at McGill and all, but when I look back, if there's one thing I would change about my playing uh, and would do much, much earlier, is a lot more singing. Whether you're singing to a fixed solfege or whether you're just singing to sing what you're gonna play so that you can correlate a musical line and the efficiency of the human voice with the efficiency of doing it on the instrument. But hearing pitches, just trust me. Please don't argue with me. Oh, you can't. I'm talking to myself. You can't even talk back at me. All right, we're getting close to the end here. I wanted to show you one other really cool thing because in a time of COVID, uh, where we, um, and I will answer that Fugelhorn question, we have to do a lot of practicing at home. One thing that I really advocate are practice mutants. If you don't have an actual practice mute, maybe a really tight cup mute. That would be another way to go, uh, like an adjustable cup, so that you can literally cause a lot of resistance. This is the uh, this is the typical Yamaha Silent Brass, the new generation. It's in there. It's in normal black, but because I'm so super famous, I've got one in red. Yeah, deal with that. Okay. Anyway, Adam's looking at really. Yeah, it's red. Uh huh. So, point is, when you work with a practice mute. One thing I often tell students is that you've probably noticed that when you put in any tight mute, like from a straight mute to a cup, sometimes you pop out a note or two higher than you normally play. That's because there's a resistance that's taking place. You can't fight with a practice mute. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to actually start finessing. And then once you do that, and then just as with a batter, you know, in baseball, they put weights on the end of the bats when they're in the, the circle and they take the weights off, now, again, back to ergonomics, you make the instrument feel light, and I'm gonna blow in a way as though the mute was there. I'm anticipating that feeling that I just simulated. And I promise you, your blow will be a lot lighter. It'll be with finesse because you're, it's, it's like you're anticipating this little bump that's taking place. This is a very, very good tool to work with because again, as I said earlier, you will learn things about how to teach yourself, what you do, and perhaps more importantly, what you don't do. But this kind of simple little resistance training is an awesome way to start working, especially in your upper register. And um, when you work in that range, you have to be efficient and effective, okay? All right, we're getting close to the end here now. I'm gonna look for another question or two, and then we're gonna wrap it up. Let's see, uh, should we be looking first where the notes resonate best? I think you were referring back, Frank, to, uh, no, I'm not going to get into a, a conversation about physics and note lengths, but that sounds like you're, you're wanting to come at it from a science angle. Again, Frank, my only answer is there's a note that you can sing on your tuner, and then you can simulate that note on the trumpet, and you must be able to simulate that note. Now, when you make adjustments to the tuning slide, one or the other, you could still put it in tune, but if you're being sensitive, you're also becoming aware of how the instrument is working with you or against you. You pull that slide way out to the point where it's going to be flat, you will have to push up to try to make that concert be flat. And then if it's pulled in all the way, If I put a tuner in front of me, I can promise you I can make that tuner be pinned in each position, but that's because I'm acutely aware of where I want to place it. But I'm also then becoming aware, if I'm sensitive, to what I'm doing differently with my body to make that happen. And that's where you start really learning. So that's how to work on it. Remember, this is metal tubing. Really cool made metal tubing by Yamaha, but it's a tube. The music has to start here and then vibrate here and be amplified. That's what these are. They're amplifiers, okay? Uh, metronome work, Psh, metronome work is exactly what it sounds like. It's work. Remember, working with a metronome is learning how to, I describe metronome work or rhythm as uh, a musical term that we would describe to non-musicians as coordination. That's what rhythm is. It's not a mystical thing. Coordination is me giving you three oranges and I could basically, in a couple of minutes, anybody can learn to kind of juggle them, even if it's just for a moment or two, and then the oranges fall. But for that minute, you're like, oh, I'm a juggler. And all you're doing is coordinating the action. A ball up or orange up, switching to another hand. That's coordination. Rhythm is the same thing. When we're working on rhythm, we have to learn how to simulate 
uh, parameters of time. So that if I'm working on tonguing, what I'm trying to do is inspire myself to understand that when I'm working on tonguing after the where the tongue is going, I dictate it, not anything else. And they're pulse points. And as I tongue faster, my pulse points become further and further apart. This burst, this, this point of time parameter is what's important when understanding rhythm. And as we go faster, we start to move those pulse points further and further apart, which also means we want to lighten up. One of the things that we do too much is we over tongue when trying to work on tongue speed. And lightness of tongue is a really, really critical element. So working with a metronome, of course, the metronome is your friend. It's not your enemy. And the metronome is not wrong. You're wrong, okay? Uh, and it was a drummer who taught me that, actually. Because I used to think, oh, man, working with a click track, what a drag. And he just looked at me and laughed. He said, what's wrong with you? Can't you be artistic within the confines of a click track? If you can't, then something's wrong with you. Ain't nothing wrong with the click. It's just doing its thing. How do you be musical within that? If you can do that, wow, then you're really ahead of the curve. So accept that practice uh, with metronome is your friend, not your enemy, okay? Really important tip. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Okay, I'm getting really super close to the end. Now needing my glasses to read these comments. Plus, there's you can see the late afternoon sun is coming in from LA. It's hot here, people. It's hot, hot, very hot. Okay, let's see. Uh, Chloe Swindler music. What are your thoughts on anchor tongue? We're not going to go down that rabbit hole too hard today. But basically, the way I tongue is I place the tip of my tongue. Ah, where my lower teeth meet, right there. So the way I, I describe it to students is say, place your the tip of your tongue where the teeth and the lower gums meet, and then try talking like that. And it'll sound something like this. You can all try it off camera because no one can hear you. Hello, my name is Yen. I play a Yamaha trumpet, and this is my silent mute. And I'm gonna have a cup of coffee right now because I can't move the tip of my tongue, so it sounds like this. That is where my tongue is all the time, all the time. And I discovered it kind of by accident in high school and it was a fantastically interesting thing to work on. And I absolutely swear by it, especially when it comes to things like, like piccolo trumpet. When you're working on certain registers of the piccolo trumpet, tongue where the back of my tongue is sort of shaped in a nice arc and the tongue is arched in a way that it allows me to get compression and air movement that if the tongue was flat and floating inside my mouth which some people like to advocate makes it a lot harder to do very very simple I know we can talk about uh, oral cavities and shapes and whether people are are literally and figuratively tongue-tied or not, dental structure, all that factors into it. But at the end of the day, and there's lots of, of, of scientific proof about this, uh, Sarah Willis, the great horn player from Berlin Phil, recently stuck herself inside an MRI machine with plastic tubes and plastic mouthpieces, and, and she filmed herself, or at least the side angle of herself, playing in different registers of the horn. There is no doubt that the tongue must rise to play in the upper register. It's right there on the screen. And so whatever that means inside each person's individual mouths is a personal journey, so to speak, but that's where the sensitivity starts. In short, I find that with anchor tongue placement, uh, I can simulate that, that particular position most effectively, okay? All right, um, we're getting super close uh, to the end. That's a, that's a much longer conversation. I don't wanna be trite about anchor tonguing. It's a, it's a pretty serious conversation, but it's a good thing to try and experiment with it just the way I I just told you, okay? Uh, so, I'm looking around here. Oh, my last comment on the flugelhorn. Yes, I do play uh, a Yamaha flugelhorn. This is the 6315. I think it's always hard to read the numbers. 8315. It's the Wayne Bergeron designed uh, flugelhorn. I think this was designed with Yamaha with Wayne. Uh, Sean Jones had a hand in it. A couple of other big superstar players. 
And there's two basic flugelhorns that the Yamaha makes. There's this one, of course, and then there's the, the Bobby Shoe model, also a spectacular instrument. And again, they're just different flavors, different tastes. They have somewhat different uh, tonal qualities. Um, for my particular taste, I found that this one slotted uh, very nicely between G and high C. Not that you have to play there an awful lot with the flugelhorn, but when I do, uh, my personal feeling was that there was a slotting that I got uh, that I really dug, which is why I went with this particular horn. Uh, although the other uh, Yamaha Fugel, the, the shoe has been around for forever for a good reason, because it works. Okay, hope that settles that one. Last one I'm going to show you today <clears throat> is this, which is also uh, a Yamaha instrument, uh, and it's the rarely seen because it's not designed anymore. Uh, it is the 90, no, hang on, I'm going to get the numbers right or somebody is going to scream at me. But it's a cool horn and I'll tell you about it. Uh, this is, yeah, that's what I thought. It's the 9910. This instrument was made as a A, B flat, and C piccolo trumpet. <clears throat> okay? And um, it's not made anymore. So in spite of the fact that I have a super full, cool fancy red mute, because I'm super famous in the Yamaha world. Actually, I'm just super fit. In fact, you guys are lucky I'm even talking to you. That's how, that's how famous I am. Incidentally, anybody that says they're famous, is not famous. Okay, we get over that? Cool. But I had to go hunting for this on the internet like everybody else. Uh, they're not made, but they're a very interesting instrument. And again, that conversation I was telling you about on uh, August, uh, pardon me, April 16th, Friday, just a couple weeks from now, uh, or less than, where I'm going to talk about the recording of the Brandenburg Second Concerto, was recorded with this particular instrument in mind. And this is a very unique uh, uh, piccolo trumpet because it has a very compact, centered sound which blends beautifully with the other three instruments. Um, and that is the whole point of this particular horn uh, because the Brandenburg II is not, uh, it's not a trumpet solo. You have to blend with a flute and a violin as well as an oboe. And it has a really, really beautiful centered sound, especially in that register. Let's see if this works. instrument, especially in that register, it tends to reward you, okay? And that was why this particular horn, I, I literally use it for one piece, and it's just used for the Brandenburg. So I'll have a lot more to talk about that if you log on with me on uh, on, on April 16th at uh, 7.30 Eastern. I think on that note, I mean, this we could be here for hours, but I'm going to wind it down right now, and I want to thank all my friends at Longham and Quaid in particular for, for allowing me to have this moment, for Yamaha, of course. Uh, for being part of my literal and musical family uh, since my career began. And um, I've enjoyed talking to all of you, and I really hope that there have been some interesting things that you've heard today, uh, some fun things, and perhaps most importantly, and hopefully, uh, you sense my enthusiasm, not just for the trumpet, but for people, um, even just basically a love of life. I'm so glad I had this chance to talk to you. Continue uh, on this journey, and soon, 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 we'll be back to some form of normal. Okay, so um, I'm going to, uh, oh, look at that. Wait a minute, I have to answer that. That's Steve Butterworth who jumped in on that. The YTR9910. Just in case you're wondering, Steve Butterworth is like the big kahuna, the boss of bosses, the mafia mobster of all time. He's head of Yamaha Canada. And I've known him since I was very, very young, so I can say it like that and have a good time. Plus, interesting bit of trivia about Steve Butterworth. He has the weirdest memory for numbers. There is not one single model number of any instrument in the Yamaha family that he doesn't know. And I'm talking about stuff that was built 30 years before he was with the company. So Steve, thanks for logging on. And to all of you, I want to thank you for a, a, an awesome couple of hours. And uh, carry on. Keep the faith. We're going to come out of this. And we're going to come out of it a lot stronger. Care for each other and be curious. That's how we'll all get better as people and as musicians. Okay? Thanks very much. Bye-bye.